Heart Research Center presents part two of A Trip into the Supernatural with best-selling author Roger Morneau. In part one of this exclusive interview, Roger Morneau told about his experiences with Satanism as a young man. Joining him again in part two are Cyril and Cynthia Grossi, who helped Roger break away from the power of darkness to discover a loving God. Conducting this interview are Dan and Karen Houghton of Heart Research Center. Let's now watch the conclusion of A Trip into the Supernatural. We continued and we continued to, to give him Bible studies with, with the smoke and all. And we got down to the Bible study where um, a health died in health. And body temple. Body temple. And he was fascinated with that. And so we finally told him that, uh, I think there's a text that uh, when men turn away from God, they turn to the bitter e uh, weed bitter herb. or herb or something. So we like the bitter herb to tobacco and mm -hmm. so on. And he was fascinated with it. And he says, well, why didn't you tell me that you didn't smoke? I think what really got him was the... Uh when he read, uh, Know ye not that your body is a temple of God, and if mm -hmm. any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. And so he asked me, what do you mean by that? So uh, my reply was, uh, well, let's take the church. We all respect the church. Would you take a cigarette into the church and smoke it? He said, of course not. Then I said, uh, would you take uh, alcohol into the church and drink it? He said, no, that would be silly. And so by making those comparisons, uh, finally I said, your body is the church, your body is the temple. He said, then my smoking, I said, right. He said, uh, why didn't you tell me this on the first night? I said, if I had told you this on the first night, you wouldn't come the second night. He said, you know, that's right. So you can see where patience uh, is, a, is, a, is a virtue. If you use patience and take your time, it pays off. He told us that he realized he was getting into demon worship to the point where it was scaring him. He was frightened. And he prayed a prayer to God, even though he didn't realize it, and it wasn't with all the trappings that right. Christians usually use. But he said, if there is a God in heaven, help me. And at that time, you were an answer to his prayer. That's right. But also... Weren't, wasn't he an answer to your prayer? He certainly was. When uh, Elder Taylor got to the point in his Bible studies of speaking about the Sabbath, all of my background, I was born in Halifax, uh, Cynthia was born in Montreal, all of my background was Baptist and some Methodist. And I couldn't see going to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. In fact, I would laugh at my wife for quite some time, even as a child, that the fact that she was going to church on the wrong day. Uh, but getting back to the point is uh, when we were taking those Bible studies and, and Nala Taylor got to the, the Sabbath question, he proved it, yet I didn't believe it. And there's a point in your, in your studying the Word of God that you want to stay with tradition rather than go with the truth. And I wanted to stay with tradition. But at the same time, the truth was pulling me back to the point where I said, I didn't even tell Cynthia this, Lord, if you want me to keep this Sabbath, let me with the knowledge I have win one soul. And if I do this, I know that it will be a sign. And not long afterward, I met Roger, sat down beside him, and he asked me for Bible studies. I know it was a sign. I'm here today. What part did Cyril's conviction about the Sabbath truth play in you being confronted by Christ with these eternal realities? So I understand that he wasn't even a baptized Seventh-day Adventist. He was baptized the first Sabbath you went to church. But what if he had not been convicted of the Sabbath and had told your Jewish boss mm -hmm. that he would be willing to work on the Sabbath? Well, I would, I would lose out on eternity, I believe. I would have lost hope. So his conviction yeah. was part of the process that Christ used to mm -hmm. confront you 
But the there's more to this. He was working for a, a nice, a real nice firm, embroidery firm. And he was studying the Bible with Pastor Taylor, and Pastor Taylor had, had brought him now to the point where he said, you should observe the seventh Sabbath if you're going to, you know, serve the Lord all the way. Serve the Lord, serve him all the way. The Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And the Lord says, why he wants us to keep it holy? Because he's, he's God and we're the cre creatures and that we ought to be counting our blessings, so to speak. Now, Cyril was pondering this thing in his mind. And he said to himself, and he prayed about it, Lord, I want some kind of a sign that you're really with me in this, that you want me to start keeping the seventh Sabbath now. But Lord, there's something missing. I tell you what, if you make it possible for me to meet someone that doesn't know about the Sabbath, because not too many people know about it anyway, and that I'm able to convince him of the importance of the biblical Sabbath of creation, then he says, I'll know that you want me to start giving a Sabbath now, instead of next year or some other time. And do you know that prayer was answered in two weeks? We figured out a time, about a time that I said, if there's a God in heaven that cares for me, help me. I think it's a couple of days after that, that, that he made a decision that, hey, Lord, show me. I know, you know, I, I just love, would like to enjoy the experience of knowing that you're listening to me and that you're doing something special for me. And I'm doing something special for you because I'm obeying your commandment. So in reality, Roger, you yeah. were an answer to his, his prayers, prayers yeah. before, while you were still a spiritist. Mm -hmm. Cyril, did you and Cynthia know at this time when you were studying with Roger that he was involved at all with spirit worship? You know, the Lord blessed us mightily. He blessed us with uh, the fact that uh, we were completely ignorant of anything. And uh, I would not advise anybody to openly go and do something like we did w with having the knowledge that uh, this person is a devil worshiper because no person has the power to overcome this on their own. Uh, but I feel uh, very impressed that the Lord, the Holy Spirit guided us mm -hmm. and our eyes were covered mm -hmm. until a certain time that we could handle it. And when was that time, Cyril? When did you discover that this man worshipped demon spirits? Uh, we discovered that midway between the lessons and uh, I don't know what, exactly what point it was, but one night he came and uh, we had previously studied on the unpardonable sin. And he came with tears in his eyes and he was very upset. And he said, uh, uh, he said he was upset and he had books on his arm. And uh, I said, well, what are you so upset about, Roger? Roger in French. And he said, well, you don't know what I've been doing. So I said, look, the Bible says all manner of sins will be forgiven. And he said, but you don't know what I've done. So after he told me what he had been doing, worshiping the devil and uh, getting acquainted with devil worship and going very deep into it, he showed me some books. And when I opened one of the books and read some instructions on how to worship the devil, I closed it up. I said, I don't want to see this. And uh, I said, but one thing I want to make clear. I said, if you had committed the unpardonable sin, you would not be here willing to study the Bible. And therefore, the scripture that says, all manner of sins will be forgiven, applies to you. I said, you must consider yourself forgiven, and you must forgive yourself. And we went on from there. I didn't even know what a devil worshiper was. I think we were both very naive. And uh, so I went along, and I said, well, I tell you what, we leave the fact whether the sin is pardonable or unpardonable to God, and let's finish the Bible study. <laughs> that, that was m all of the um, information and uh, knowledge that I had. And it wasn't until later, and then he began telling us, uh, you know, a little bit about the troubles he was having, and I, I thought that was rather unusual, and, and, and we're being involved. Now, Cyril, whenever you did learn, you and Cynthia, about this spirit 
spiritism business. Mm -hmm. You immediately had a question about whether or not it was real. You, well, you, you, you were really naive about that. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us, you, you had some special dispensation, uh, some special work with the, uh, with the police department there in Canada, and you had the ability to carry a gun, is that right? Yes, I had a permit to carry a gun. And uh, when he told me that not only was he having these manifestations, he was also having, he heard footsteps walking down his hall. He lived at the end of a long hall, and his door was the only door down that hall. And the footsteps would stop as he, at his door, then a rap would come to the door. And we were also having trouble with the union at that time. So when he told me about mm -hmm. these rappings on the door, I said, no, that's only those union people trying to come and get you. Yeah. So I said, uh, I'll scare them away just the same as I scared them away when they came to get me. And so I had so much uh, faith in the gun that, uh, don't forget, I wasn't baptized at this time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I had sure. uh, faith in this gun. So I took my gun and we went to Rotate's place and we were laughing and talking and just having a jolly time. And at midnight, we heard the footsteps coming down the hall. I said, uh, Roger, put your hand on the doorknob and get ready to pull it open. And so, with all the bravado that I could muster with a gun, hmm. I uh, waited for the rap on the door, and there it came. And I don't know exactly how many times the rap came. But well, first you opened the door, and yeah. there was nobody there. Right. And you said, now, now, his color changed. The color of his face changed. <laughs> the color of his face oh, yes. changed? Yeah, that Believe it or not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> he was expecting union people. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't anybody there. <laughs> there was nobody there. What, what, was your, what was your emotion at that moment, sir? What did you, when, you, when that door came open? And there was nothing there. Well, his emotion, excuse me for jumping in here, okay. was that uh, he was almost uh, like you know, a uh, statue of salt. That, that was your observation, <laughs> yeah. Roger. That's right. So I said, hey, let's sit down, man. I said, the, you know, the, 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 they're not going to harm us. So we sat down on several, mm -hmm. and we talked some more. There was no problem. And about 10 minutes later, the spirit knocked on my balcony door. And the, the, the glass was loose a little bit in there, and it rattled pretty bad. And did he still have all the bravado? <laughs> by, by then, he, he jumped right out of his seat, <laughs> didn't you, Cyril? And he said, let's get out of here, you know, because he had knocked real hard. Yeah. It was at that time I said, uh, mm -hmm. Roger, I think it's time for me to get rid of the gun. <laughs> and get baptized. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. That made him make his that was baptized. Well, I've heard of yeah. lots of ways the decisions are made, um, but that was that's that's probably one of the most unique I've heard. Sarah. Dramatic to say the least. Yeah. We were like children dealing with something we had no knowledge about, and he protected us. And uh, like I said, if anyone knows of someone who who is involved in this, they can't do it alone. Requires it, special prayer and it requires, protection. Doesn't and it? it requires the Lord to be the one to handle the situation. A man cannot handle the situation because uh, the the powers and principles that involved in this, no man can withstand. What gave you the sense that you now had an opportunity for salvation? What was it that told you you had a chance? Well. Um, the Holy Spirit was inspiring me. The Holy Spirit was mis ministering to me the grace of redemption. And to be able to, to put it into words, uh, I don't have this kind of a vocabulary, because it, it's, it's a mystery type thing. The Holy Spirit recreates you as, as, as he ministers to you, you see? And uh, cleans your mind and gives you understanding. And, and uh, you see things in different light that you never thought about before. Life becomes a meaningful thing all of a sudden. And you'd be waiting to die for it, you see, for, for what you've learned. Because that's what I said to myself. The second night when I went back home, I, I had about an hour in the streetcar to my place. I got home at 12 o'clock. I said, hey, if they do me in tonight, I'm going to have, I have the beautiful experience of having learned these great, wonderful things about God. Beautiful things. So on Wednesday night, there I had the first hope. I can't remember exactly what verse of scripture was, but, uh, but uh, this one uh, here says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You see, and since you had explained what it meant. And you took that right into your heart. Yeah. Roger, mm -hmm. during these three days, from Monday night, Tuesday night, to Wednesday night, 
What went through your mind regarding the spirits? I knew that I was going to uh, be worked over by the spirits, either through one of their boys or some accident or something, see. This is the way I felt, I mean. And um, I said, this is very unusual, that nothing has happened yet. And I'm going home on Wednesday night again with, it, with another appointment for Thursday Bible studies at 7 o'clock. Now, let me make sure I understand. You had missed Wednesday night's spirit praise yeah, oh service, yes. uh, yeah. at which time you were supposed to have I've made your here. full commitment. Yeah, I would have And you had been at an a answer. Bible study instead. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happened next? So I said, um, this will be the end of it. Wednesday night, I said, they, they'll have a praise session to the gods, and that'll be it. Uh, but nothing happens Wednesday night. Thursday morning I was alive. And I went back for another Bible study. And, and that is four more. And uh, by then I realized that the Creator was taking care of things. Because these people never give God the glory. But they always refer to higher powers. They, respect, they, re, they, they pride themselves on the fact that they respect authority. You see? So therefore, they, they recognize the Creator for, for who He is. And, uh, but of course, the, the Master, fallen Lucifer, is just as smart as God is. And He's got, he's got it worked out, so He's going to have a kingdom to him, Himself for eternity. And, you know, you don't have to worry about things. So, I realized that, that the power of God was intervening. Now, I became a, a brave. See? And the Spirit of God gave me the strength to do that. Because I... I said that God gave me the strength to be able to die for, for these things that I just learned. You see? And that's what happened. I got those uh, Bible studies. So you went ahead and went to a Bible studies on Friday night? Yeah. And then you kept your first Sabbath, oh, didn't yeah. you? Tell, tell us about your experience on Sabbath. <clears throat> first, that evening, um, before I left, 11 o'clock, Cyril says, uh, you enjoy the Bible studies. Oh, yeah, very, very much so. I said, tomorrow you people are going to church. He says, yeah. I said, uh, interesting. He said, would you like to come with us? I said, yeah. Because I had, the, I had the Bible study on the Sabbath already. I said, sure. I'm still alive. And he said, what do you mean by you're still alive? Well, I said, I said you know, I said, well, if I'm still alive, uh, I'll, be, I'll be here, I'll do this, I'll do that. But I knew what I was, what I'd said. I'm still alive. And uh, he said, "Would you join us here, uh, and we'll walk to church? It's not that that far. We'll, uh, we'll walk a few blocks, and uh, nice, uh, be a nice day tomorrow." I said, "Yeah, sure, meet you here." And uh, we walked to church, and we were welcome at the door. And there was a rack of, of uh, uh, brochures on the walls. I walked over and looked at some of them, picked up a couple, put it in my pocket. And uh, we were from Sabbath school, and I thought it was great. Roger, the Lord helped you get through the Sabbath day without smoking. How did you eventually deal with your smoking habit? Well, I tell you, Pastor Taylor uh, talked, uh, you know, for quite a while. When it got to be about quarter seven in the evening, I was getting uh, very distressed because I, I got a tremendous urge of smoking about an hour before. And I said, oh, i got to have a cigarette. I just can't stand it anymore. And uh, as the pastor continued explaining what I had to ask him to explain, uh, it was difficult for me. And <clears throat> as he left, I told Cyril, uh, and said, yes, I'm sorry, but I, I got to smoke. And um, on the way home in the streetcar, I said to myself, this is going to be, it's used expression, but hell on earth, to give up smoking. Then I said, no, it's not going to be, because I'm going to have help. I got to my apartment, and I opened a closed closet, and I had two cartons of cigarettes on the shelf. And I opened them up, and threw all the cigarettes, you know, all the packs were opened up, threw them in, into the toilet, and, and flushed it down the drain. And uh, then I knelt by the little table that I had there with, with my Bible on it, and uh, I had that already had started to read that crucifixion of Christ, which I have read for 45 years now, every morning. Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 24 through 54. Every day, God willing, I, I 
always read it. Well, now I can have my devotions at night, and I don't have to put the light on because I know it by heart. See, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, there I place my trust and and my life in the in the care of the Lord of Glory, who had shed his precious blood on Calvary, to acquire the legal right to be able to redeem me from where I was and from where I was going. So it was the end of smoking. It never, never had a desire to smoke again. Mm -hmm. I told him to take the desire away to recreate me. I realized that he was a creator he can recreate. Yeah. Rogers, you came closer to making a full commitment to God. Did the demons try to prevent you from making that commitment in any way? Well, I didn't have to wait too long. <laughs> Uh, during the week, the Spirit of God held back the, the demon spirit so that he could not have access to me. I realized that from Wednesday night on. Then, as I came uh, home at midnight of that uh, Saturday night, there was a note on my door from my buddy. And he said, it is urgent that I talk to you tonight. I don't care if you call me in the middle of the night. But he says, I've got to talk to you. We're having a terrible disaster. To, uh, you know, facing a terrible disaster. So uh, I said, well, Roland, one well, must, must have gotten some, some real static, you know. Short sure enough. <clears throat> First of all, I wanted to, to review something that we studied at night. So I had a book. They had they lent me a book, uh, uh, St. John's Herald, and I had opened the book up and I started to, to read and uh, there was a marker, a sheet of paper actually that had been cut in half in there and uh, I had put it on the table and uh, the piece of paper started to levitate and move around the room. See? So it didn't bother me. I knew, I knew what was, who was doing it. And then the, the sheet of paper came and and stood about a foot above my book. Then it was slapped down on the book, and the book fell on my lap, and almost into the floor I picked it up. And I felt like saying, telling the spirits, you know, buzz off. But uh, I had understood that it's, 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 I would not, again, talk with spirits. I made up my mind on that. So I pick up the book again, started to write, and then the spirit picked up the book and threw it across the room against the wall with tremendous force. So I decided, well, I'm going to go and phone my buddy, see what he's going to do. Now, there was a, a phone, a public phone in the hallway. I didn't want to use it. I went down to a, a diner or restaurant or just uh, down the block, and I called him up. How's things rolling? He says, man, he says, Oh, he says, don't you care for my life, Morno? What kind of a friend are you? I've been suffering, he says, since Wednesday. He says, trying to get a hold of you. And he says, I've been waiting at your door. What time did you come home? I said, come home at midnight. He said, you're in real trouble. Because this, the high priest, as a spirit, appeared to him. Wednesday evening and told him that you had you were studying the Bible with some Christians but you were not just studying the, studying the Bible with Christians you were studying the Bible with Seventh-day Adventists the people that the master hates most on the face of the planet how with the world did you get yourself involved in something like that don't you care for your life I said sure beside that he says and he told me in, uh, other things that the spirits had told, uh, you know, uh, the uh, high priest. So it went, the conversation went on the phone for a while, and I said, now listen, it's not possible for me to explain to you over the phone what has taken place in my study in the Bible four hours per evening, you know, through the week. Why don't you come to see me tomorrow sometime, and I'll give you the reasons, the real reasons why. I did what I did. He said, okay. So we made an appointment for uh, some time Monday, uh, Sunday morning. And uh, I went back after my phone call, I went back to my apartment. And then 
Uh, I decided I might as well get to bed. It's light. I get to bed. I was not sure in bed that the lights went on. I got up, went to the lights on. Went back to bed, the light goes on again. I said to myself, there's no use getting up, turning the lights off. They're going to put them back on again. So I'm going to decide to go to sleep with, with the lights on. So after a while, things start moving around the place. A picture on that wall <laughs> goes and sticks itself on the wall. There's no, uh, nothing to hold it up. And the light that was on the table moved and stands in midair. It stays there. Were you feeling afraid at this time? Oh, no, not at all. No. No, no because of the fact that, uh, you see, you get, human beings get accustomed to a lot of things. And you get supernatural strength, either from good or evil. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was, was uh, singing me through this thing. And I knew that I was going to have a terrible struggle somewhere along the way, some, somehow. And you were going to try to destroy me, no question about it. So, after this nonsense had gone uh, quite a while, I, I went on to sleep. Hey, I'm going to get my rest. I'm tired. I said, Lord, you know, bless the old guy. I was not old in those days. No, but I said, bless the fellows. I can get some rest from these spirits. And I went to sleep. And they, it woke me up about 2 o'clock in the morning again. And at 4 o'clock, now 4, four o'clock in the morning there, I, I sat up in bed, pushed my pillow in the back, and I said to myself, what in the world? am I going to do? Because the Lord doesn't clear the mouth of, uh, for me. Then I, I got a thought that maybe the Lord just wants me to know from the spirits exactly how things are, uh, how I'm standing with them. And I said to the spirit, you want to talk to me? The spirit said, yes, finally, and we will talk to you. What in the world do you think you're doing? You see, the Lord had held back even on the spirits, and the spirits could not talk to me. I realized that they were under a, a very special control. So I got to talk with the spirit, and I realized that he was a spirit counselor, because he said, the master has tremendous plans for your life. Fame, honor, respect, wealth. Don't you value any of these things? I said, I said, I want you to know, Spirit, that uh, 10 days ago, I would have grabbed your offer. But now you're talking to a former Spirit worshiper, and I'm educated to the reality of life, especially of the reality of eternal life. And I said, I'm not interested. For about maybe two or three minutes, maybe four minutes, and that's a long time. In a conversation, there was n no response to what I had said. It was like he was totally amazed by your yeah. courage. Yeah. Then when the spirit spoke again, he had a, 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 a tremor in his voice. In other words, you know when a person gets really desperate in a crisis situation, your voice is, 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 changes. And uh, it gave me the impression that he had a hard time expressing himself. And that was a very clever uh, individual. Well, he said, we've worked for so long, over the years, to prepare you for the master's work. And what are you doing? You know? And, things like that. and uh, he told me, OK, you're, you're, you're turning down the offer of the master. I said, definitely. He said, from now on, he says, you will, poverty will be a lot of your life. That is, he says, if you can manage to stay alive. And he says, that, I doubt that, that you won't going to have much of. He says, your days are numbered. I said, you know, Spirit, the high priest has mentioned about higher powers. I'm uh, affiliated now with higher powers. And I said, I don't have to concern myself with you or your master or any of the other spirits. Because you're all losers. I am the winner. A hundred million years of perfect life, recreated, translated, or resurrected body that I'll have. Uh, my years will be uh, counted into the millions of years. If I take the offer of the master, what do I have? 
I'm 20 years of age. Ed, even if I live to be 100, how can you compare that to 100 million years? And I'll have a, all the gold that I want and the silver that you're offering me, and more. So I'm not a loser no more. I'm a winner. And the spirit, the spirit says, will destroy you. And he laughed. He had this, this, this was frightening. For, for, for one time, he had this laugh that, uh, that caused me to think immediately of the laugh that Nero, instantly, Nero must have had on his face when the lions were tearing the Christians apart. That's the thing I said, this is the way that Nero must, must have laughed. When the, the lions were tearing Christians apart, you know, in the arena of the Colosseum in Rome. Yeah. So how did the spirit finally leave, Roger? He finally leave, almost took the door away with him. <laughs> he left through the balcony door, and the door um, was slammed open. Yeah, open. And the, the door knob almost went through the plaster in the wall. Did he leave on his own accord? I commanded him to. I commanded him in the name of the Lord Jesus to leave my place to come no more. And he left? And he left. And instead of slamming the door shut behind him, like a person would, he slammed the door open as he went out and he slammed in, in, into the wall of the, and, and the doorknob, Cyril may still remember, you could see the imprint of the uh, doorknob in, in the plaster of an, the house was maybe uh, 50 years old, so the plaster had been settled a long time. You commanded the demon to leave by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yep. He, he left, Jesus. slammed the door. Did you go back to sleep? Yep. And then the next morning, your friend Roland came over. Well, it, it, between that, uh, I'd like to tell you a bit okay. more. I woke up in the morning, of course, and I said, my, time to get up. And uh, my Bible, my night table was to my left as I was laying in bed. I put my hand on the Bible, and then I started to shuffle, you know, the pages, like this. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about many things, and I was doing this. And all of a sudden, I opened the Bible, wide open. And then I got thinking about it again. Never realized what I'd done. I got up, and after uh, I straightened myself out a little bit, I, I, I looked at the, at the Bible, and my eyes fell on this uh, Isaiah chapter by uh, Isaiah uh, uh, the prophet, and I got to read it, and it was the experience of Ezekiah when uh, Sennacherib, the great general of the armies of the Assyrians, had uh, compassed about the city of Jerusalem, and he was telling uh, Ezekiah that he might as well give up, open the gates, you know, you're not going to survive this because we've destroyed all the nations uh, that we've gone through before getting here. And uh, I was very impressed. The fact that Zechariah took the letter that the general had sent him, and he went in the, in the temple of the Lord and placed it before the Lord, and he talked to the Lord about the, the letter. You see? And as for his protecting care and, and guidance. And when he had not yet returned to his, to his castle, when uh, Isaiah came, the prophet, and he told, uh, he says, the, the Lord has got a message for you. The way that Sennacherib has come, that's the way that he's going to return. And uh, I love that prayer. That is a kind of prayer. I memorized that. It was a beautiful prayer. Because I got, from that moment on, I got an inner desire to fortify myself with the Word of God. Because every time that I, that I read the verse in the Bible that applied to my condition, I received encouragement and strength. And I said, this is what I need to do. I'm going to fortify myself with, with the Word of God. I'm, I'm going to memorize the Word of God. I, I, I write there and then I took a piece of paper. I underlined those verses of the prayer of Ezekiel in red in the Bible. I wrote down on a piece of paper, put it in my pocket, my coat pocket. So when I traveled on the tramway, you see, I could memorize uh, that. And I've done that now for uh, <laughs> 45 years and I'm still memorizing things, you know. Because Elda says to me once, she said, are you still memorizing? I said, yeah. Why are you memorizing? You know so much of the Bible and everything. He said, well, I need some more. you gotta, you got to have to uh, keep feeding yourself spiritually. Mm. And that was the blessing that it, that it was. I saw there 
a beautiful deliverance. And then I read the rest of the chapter, and it shows that during the night, the angel of the Lord went out. So when the general and his uh, officers uh, woke up in the morning, they looked over the camp, and all their soldiers were dead. And they took off for Nineveh before they were done in. And he went uh, to the temple of Nishroth, his god, and uh, Sennacherib, and while he was worshipping there, uh, his sons came in and put a dagger in his back. And he fled to, to the land of the Arameans. I was very impressed with that. And I, had, I left it, the, the Bible open there. I had my worship. When my friend came over, uh, the Bible was still there. So, Whenever your friend Roland came over, you had just finished your worship time and you had read the story about yeah. Sennacherib. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Was, did he feel agitated? Was he upset? Oh, yeah. He came in and sat himself down and he said, I can't believe it. Not, of all people, he says, not Mona, would do a stupid thing like daring the spirits. You know? He said, you're, you're, in, you're an intelligent man, aren't you? You know, you, you got a choice. The high priest tells me, that if you come to see him with me now, no problem. Everything is going to be straightened out of the spirits. He promised him that already. He got that assurance. And he said, uh, let's do the right thing. Why gamble with your life? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I don't feel like going to see the high priest. Now or ever. And we conversed about, uh, about a number of things, and uh, he said, well, I hate to have to tell you this, but seeing that you don't, you decided that you're not going to have anything to do anymore with, with the master and his people. I hate to tell you this, that the priest, the high priest told me that a price has been put on your life. A medical doctor, remember, he gave me the name, has pledged $10,000 to have you done in. How did you feel whenever you found out that you had a contract out on your life? Well, uh, it surprised me a little, but I had, I had prepared myself for something worse. So that I didn't, uh, it didn't bother me too much. Because, see, the strength of the Lord, the word of the Lord was, the Spirit of God was giving me strength. Okay, was the yeah. presence of the Spirit of God evident to Roland there that Sunday yeah. morning? As we talked, and now he decided that, that he was losing he was losing the battle. He became very nervous. And he got up and went to the door, put his head on the door, and we talked there. He says, Mono, please, if it's not for your sake, do it for me. Do you realize what's going to happen to me if something happens to you? I don't know how to go to treat me. I said, hey, man, let me tell you something. I got a, night, I got a suggestion for you. You, join, you. you come with me. I'll guarantee you all the protection that you need to live the right, ripe old age. And beside that, I'll tell you what. Uh, you should go back and tell the high priest and all his boys to come to our church. I'll arrange for my minister to have a uh, hundred spaces there right off the center aisle. I felt like I'm making them an invitation. Well, he says, well, I would never say a stupid thing like that. He says, well, that's, that's your responsibility. I said, uh, no, you, uh, things are settled. He lit a cigarette, and as he lit the cigarette, I, I, I saw his hand shake like this. And uh, I said, you're quite nervous. Well, let me tell you, he says, there's a power here a presence that I'm not accustomed to. I'm very uncomfortable because there's a, there's a power here that's a, that, that makes me terribly uh, uncomfortable. Well, I said, you know what it is? It's the presence of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Creator, the life giver. And I said, every other power is subject unto that higher power. You're aware of that. Oh, yeah. So that's the way that um, it ended. He now, decided to go. 
he told you that you had a contract put out in your life. Yeah. How did you respond to him? He was nervous, but he said oh, yes. to you, you're, yeah. you're walking under the shadow of death, mm -hmm. Morneau. How did you respond? I said, my friend, I've got some news for you. Not so much for you as, as it is for the high priest. And now the Spirit of God gave me very special righteous indignation. Have you ever heard of that terminology? That when I heard that they were going to do me in with, uh, you know, have me shot, I said, look, I got some news for the high priest and his boys. The day that they wiped me out and you know, they uh, do me in will be the day that the life giver is going to pull the bread of life on all of them except the high priest. And they'll be dead cadavers there in the, in, in, in the temple. And tell the high priest this, don't call funeral directors because they don't, they don't have enough, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to spend the coffins, no, the, 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 the wagon. Oh, hearses. Hearses. <laughs> I said, you better call the, the fire department of Montreal. Then you pile them all up there, the whole hundred of them. I said, this is what's going to take place. He said, he said, you're a fool. I said, you think so? Let me show you something picked up the Bible, and I said, I'm going to tell you a little story. Make it short. He said, it's short because says, I'm, I'm going. I said, listen to this. I just read this this morning. There's a man by the name of Hezekiah that believed in the Creator a few hundred years back. And let me tell you, tell you what happened to him. Sennacherib came with his armies, told him the story. He went before the Lord and, and, and prayed about it. And the Lord says, the way that Seneca came, he says, that's the way he's going to go home. And during the night, 185,000 men were, were destroyed by the angel of the Lord. So I said, don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I said, I can assure you that if they put a bullet in me, they're all going to lose out. Because the, the Creator will remove the breath of life. And I felt as sure of that as if uh, I have, it was a prediction that I think the Lord would have backed up my word. So how did he respond after you told him that story? Well, he said, uh, I guess he says that I've lost my, my time. Before we part, he says, I don't want to even shake your hands because you're not a friend of mine no more. I said, have it your way. If ever we meet one another anywhere in the city of Montreal, don't you ever look at me like you know me because I'll ignore you and embarrass you, he says, wherever we are. He says, fine. No problem with that at all. Now, Roger shared with you that his former associates that worship demons, that were part of that elite uh, spirit worship group in Montreal, were very unhappy with him, as were the demonic mm -hmm. powers, for studying especially with Seventh-day Adventists. That's right. Mm -hmm. Did he ever share with you or tell you that there might be some danger involved for you? He did tell us uh, something that rather startled me. He said he got a call from somebody in that organization, and uh, they threatened our lives, and they knew us by name. And, of course, nobody followed him. And I had to assume that the, the powers of darkness were able to c communicate to those people that worshipped what our names were, they knew our, our names. And uh, the things, uh, some of the events that followed were such that I, f I attributed them to, uh, to demon powers. Cynthia, there was a, an event mm -hmm. that was a little startling to you and to Cyril, and I know Roger was interested in it as well. You had a fire at your house shortly after the Bible studies were going on. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, shortly after the uh, Bible studies, um, we were sitting, we were living with um, my uh, father at the time. So we had a very large front room, pretty large front room. And we were sitting in the room and my brother came up who had a little problems of his own. And uh, we, they were using uh, some cleaning fluid to, to get something off of a piece of uh, clothing. And my brother suggested that um, it wouldn't burn and that he wanted to, to try it out to see if it would or wouldn't burn 
And since it was a very large room, I guess he felt that uh, the fumes wouldn't be as concentrated as probably in a smaller room. So he just decided to light a match. And I guess the fumes didn't sink to the ground, but they had ri risen up to where we were sitting, and the f fumes burst in the room at waist, at our at our waist, about our waist mm -hmm. as we sat down. They burst into flames. Into flames. It burst into flames. The floor was never burned at all. It was just um, as three feet off the ground, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody disappeared. And Cyril, he went downstairs to get a blanket, and my brother. He disappeared. I was in, in further into the room um, near the window, which was on the front side of the house. And I said, well, it, it isn't going to stop, so I better do something. So I jumped up on the, the uh, chair, which turned out to be a stuffed chair, so I wasn't helping myself by any means. Then I looked at the window, which was about three feet from me, and I said, well, if I was already on the third floor, and I said, well, I'll jump from the, third, uh, in, from the window onto the balcony, which was on the second floor. It was a very small ba uh, balcony. So I looked at the, the window, and the curtains had started going up in flames. And I said, you know, I just might miss that balcony and hit the cement. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, that's not going to work. So I stayed there, and then I just became paralyzed. And... Uh, the only thing that was working was my mind. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want to die. I just married a year, and my whole life is in front of me, and if you can see any way I can get out of here, please do something. And um, I waited, and I, I didn't get any answer. And pretty soon, as if somebody had hit me to knock me off the chair, the force of it, somebody said, jump now which meant no questions or any other kind of rationalizations I was giving it. And I bent down to, to, to start a sort of a broad jump. And at that side of the room, I was at least eight feet from the door. And I got down, and between me and the door was a radio, um, a floor-length radio with a lamp on it. And when I got down, when I crouched down to make the broad jump, I was outside of the room before Cyril came upstairs with the blanket. I don't remember how I got there. You were just kind of moved. It just moved. And then what happened where you had just been? <laughs> the, um, the can of gasoline apparently was, was sitting. It wasn't gasoline, it was naphtha. Naphtha was, was uh, right by the chair, and it blew right up, a big hole into the ceiling, just as I moved away. And... Uh, my hair was burnt, all my face was burnt, and well, not all, right around here. And my eyebrows were gone. And, uh, and he asked me, he said, how, how did you get out of the room? Because by this time, the room was totally in flames. And I said, I don't know. I said, but I prayed. And I was there. He didn't need the blanket then. <laughs> mm. The Lord answers our prayers in spite of what the devil may try to do to he us, doesn't to he? Do. After the fire, and we moved away, and we were getting ready to come to the United States. We, of all places, moved in with an Irish family. The in, in a French neighborhood. In a French neighborhood. <laughs> partying. They loved to party. But we stayed to ourselves pretty much because we, we felt that we would soon be leaving the country anyway. And they turned out to be really nice people. But while we were there, we had several um, different things happen. Like, for instance, we would say our prayers and get in bed, and then the doors would start slamming, and the windows would go up, and the wind would come through the room. And it terrified us. And uh, so we went to bed every day, every night, with our Bible under our pillow. We'd turn on the light, and everything would be calm, like, you know, as you expect. And then this would happen for, it happened for, a couple of weeks, and then uh, another thing started. Um, dishes would act like they were falling out of the closets, and uh, um, somebody was sweeping with a broom on a hardwood floor, and 
all kinds of different things, and I was terrified. I, I, I wouldn't stay in there, um, you know, at all. Did this happen? <coughs> Excuse me, did this happen during the Bible studies or you no, were giving this? No, this is after, this afterwards. Right after this. We had a lot of things happen to us afterwards. For a couple of months. So you were harassed mm -hmm. by harassed. the demonic spirits That's right. for your role mm -hmm. in bringing Roger mm -hmm. to a knowledge mm -hmm. of biblical truth for several months. For now, several months. how did mm -hmm. it stop? The powers of darkness don't really stop. Uh, the only way you can keep them in check is on your knees, prayer. I don't think anybody is uh, immune to the problems that come about as a result of uh, the devil's work. The devil is working uh, against us full time. He knows his time is short, and there's no way of saying that, oh, he, he stopped. Because when you say he stopped, that's the time he's going to start. We still have problems today that uh, we know that uh, the devil is behind them. Many of the mistakes that we make, or that we think we make, have been, we, we've been set up most, in most cases. And that's why the Lord wants us to pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a time whenever you were experiencing a difficulty that you felt was the direct result of the demonic forces being angry with you? That you wished that you had never met Roger? Never. Yeah. Never. I'd do it all over again. If, uh, if the same situation occurred, I'd be willing to do it all over again. Uh, there's no... Life is not as important as eternity. And a soul is not... Uh, cannot be uh, turned away because uh, of your own fear or your own lack of uh, courage. Uh, there will never be a time when I was, I'd be sorry. After the demon left you that Saturday night, did you have any more demon harassment over the next few months, or was it just over instantly? Mm -hmm. No, it was not over uh, instantly. Every night, the spirits knocked on the walls, knocked on the doors. I was awakened two or three times a night. They were trying to uh, reopen conversation with me. The Lord would not allow them to, uh, to bother me in any ways, except that they he tried to open it to have commun communication with me and that it seems that the Lord see we the, the Creator has given us freedom of choice you can choose good or choose evil you see that's your prerogative uh, it's a freedom that he has given us which is beautiful freedom of choice well of course the enemy of the Lord says hey I want access to it at least you can allow me to knock on the door he responds you lost him. He's mine. So I knew that very well. And uh, it went for six months that the spirit knocked every night. Did you wonder why they were continuing to do that? Oh, yeah. I said, hey, thank you, Lord. It's all you allowed them to do. <laughs> you know? <laughs> they would love to destroy me, bring the ceiling down and the whole building on me, for that matter. But I said, I figured to myself, this is the thorn in the flesh. See, I'd read the... Uh, Second Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, because of the abundance of the revelations that he had received from God and all that, he says, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, because a human fallen human heart just loves to think good of itself and becomes proud and vain and uh, sin against its, its creator. And uh, the Apostle Paul says, I'm going to pray about it. He said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times he prayed about it. And the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Isn't that beautiful? So the apostle said, therefore, most gladly will I rejoice in my infirmities that this, the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I said the same thing to, to, to the Lord. Lord, if, that's, if you want these critters to, you know, uh, be after me all the days of my life and knock and wake me up every night. That's okay with me. That's the least I could put up with, you know. So when did it stop? Well, one prayer meeting, uh, the minister says, how's things going? He says, with your Christian walk. I said, sir, couldn't go any better. He says, I'm glad for you. you know? This was after the prayer meeting. We're just leaving. And he said, uh, 
No problem with the spirits at all, huh? Oh, the spirits, why, yeah, they, they, they're trying to open communication with me all the time. You knock every, uh, every night, they wake me up. You do? How can you put up with that? <laughs> there's, no, there's no other way. Oh, no, no, he says, wait a minute now. He says, it's my fault I didn't tell you this. He says, the spirits have an open avenue to you that God cannot close. As long as you have in your place the literature that you, or some of the uh, things that you had to do with spirit worship. Do you have anything like that in your place? Oh, yeah, I got three books. Then I got some incense. And I got some candles. Well, he said, get rid of all this mess, and, and you're not going to be part of the spirits anymore. I'm sure of that. Well, I did exactly what he told me. Stop completely. Okay. Now, today, I'm a blessing to somebody else. A lady wrote me from California. She said, it's very urgent that I get your phone number because I have to talk to you. I cannot write, you know. She said, I couldn't tell you everything in writing. I need to talk to you so greatly because of the fact that I have a being uh, spirit oppressed, demon spirit oppressed. Well, I got the letter and immediately, oh, she told me, yes, she gave me her phone number and she said, if you could call me, I'll call you right back. And, and because the, of the, she has an answering machine, she's a widow. So she doesn't answer the phone. She always let the machine answer, you know, first before she called anybody back. So I called her up. And she told me what she was up against. She said, you've got to help me. Like she says, you've got to help me. You know what I mean? It was, she said, nobody else can. It wasn't a question. It was a no. plea. Uh, yeah. She said, you've got to help me, Brother Mono. The ministers can't help me over here. And even the president of our conference think I'm crazy. Isn't that sad? Well, I said, uh, exactly what's the problem? And he, she told me, I'm reading my Bible. And she said, the spirit picked up the Bible and threw it against the wall like, across the room. And when I read your book, I said, this is it. That's the same uh, thing. She told me about being bounced up on her bed, 3 o'clock in the morning, you know from the ceiling down to the bed, thrown on the bed. And uh, how things move around the house, and this, the, she hears uh, a man's voice downstairs, down there, there's nobody. And then she said, the doors open and shut. I go back and check things, everything is locked. The windows open by themselves and shut. So what did you tell her? I told her, lady, I said, you're being demon spirit oppressed. What can we do about it? The ministers, my minister says, won't even talk to me anymore about anything. He says, hi, sister, how have you been today? And he tries to talk to somebody else as soon as possible so that I, I don't have to tell him that in the past week I, I had some problem. Well, I said, lady, with God's blessing, you got your problem solved. And I, I gave her the recipe. And what's the recipe? I said, now you're going to have to do something very special, okay? I'll do anything that you tell me to do that is in accordance with the will of the Lord. I said, you're going to have to acquaint yourself with the power of the blood of Christ, the redeeming power of the blood of Christ, and what he can do for you that you can do for yourself. Besides saving you for eternity, he can redeem you from, from this oppression. First, I said, before we go into this, Tell me, have you ever had anybody in, in the last few years, because she said it came back, it started a few years back, about 10 years ago, and every two or three years she had this kind of an experience, but it didn't last very long. So I told her, what you have, sister, you have a taint of demon spirit defilement. Demon spirits have, have got direct access to you, and the Lord can, uh, cannot really help you there, because you have in your home something that belongs to someone that is involved with the spirits of the dead, the supposed spirits of the dead, which are really, really demon spirits. As anyone that you know that could be involved with the spirits of the dead, she said, yes, the blind lady. I've been taking care of for the last two years, every three, three days per week. She's given me a, a scarf, she's given me a Bible, she's given me different other things. 
She said, do you think that that could be the, the thing? After she told me the experience of the old lady, the blind lady, that was it. She didn't want that Bible because the Bible is giving you trouble now. She prays, uh, she prays to her mother and she conversed with her mother. You see, the, the dead mother. The blind lady. The blind lady. And she said, that Bible is giving you trouble. She says, would you like a Bible? So the lady says, well, I have that one already. She says, I'm going to give it to somebody. Why don't you take it? So she had taken the Bible. When she brought the Bible home, that was the beginning of the whole thing. Now, now the spirits were really moving in. And then she gave her a scarf and gave her other tricks like that. I said, and now... So you told her to get rid of that That's stuff. right. Now it's 10 o'clock at night. When I'm, because she, she called me back because she was not home. She'd gone to visit her sister 30 miles away. And she came back. And, and we're talking now at 10 o'clock at night. I said, you want some peace tonight? She says, yes. Take everything, put it in the garage. Then sit yourself down with your Bible and read Matthew, the 27th chapter, the crucifixion of Christ, uh, very attentively and prayerfully and respectfully. You're going to read those 30 verses from verse 24 through 54. And I said, then you tell, talk to the Lord about it and your problems are over. And sure enough, she called me back uh, the next day. It was on a Saturday night. She, uh, she told me first, call back. No problem at all. No noise. Okay, she's gone. And has not returned. Except once. She phoned me up. She says, there's a problem. <coughs> yes? Yes, I, I hear the, 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 the walking again. All you do. Have you given away everything I told you that, that you had gotten from, from uh, this person? Yeah. But she says, I've been thinking about this. There's a man, she says, that uh, dated me, you know, her uh, husband died, right? And uh, a couple of years later, uh, somebody in introduced her to this man. And uh, they went out for a few months together, and then she decided uh, that he would never become an Adventist because of the fact that he believed in the spirits of the dead so much, you know, and especially of his cousin, they talk about his cousin all the time. And he had given her a lawnmower. I said, you got a lawnmower in the place? He says, yeah. Get rid of the lawnmower. Take the lawnmower and put it outside of your garage. Don't have it on your property. She called me back and said, everything is fine. You, you, you mean to tell me now, Roger, that if someone who is a spiritist mm -hmm. or is involved in any form of spiritualism yep. gives something to someone mm -hmm. that they have in their home, mm -hmm. that that gives the spirits the right? An avenue, open avenue. Yep. Now, a lot of people are uh, afraid that people are going to put an X on them. Because if they take a piece of your hair or, or something that belongs to you, you put an X on you, that's baloney. The Lord takes care of all this nonsense. But when the spiritist or somebody that's involved with demon spirits in some form or other gives you anything and you bring it to your home, the, the spirits have got access to your home openly at all times. And the Lord cannot help you. I'm sorry to see it. He cannot help you until you voluntarily remove those things. That is correct. Yeah. But that does not mean that he doesn't hold them in check because they oh, yeah. would love yeah, to destroy. destroy them, yeah. <clears throat> I've come across a lot of people that have been writing to me and they said they've been, they've had demon spirits cast out of them by one of those deliverance ministries. And I have one lady that has been 10 years now since she had demon spirits uh, casted out of them, uh, out of her. It took 13 hours and they of uh, praying and talking to the spirits to get the spirits out of her. She said it was like a a couple of hundred spirits, you see, in her and all that. And this person's spirit has been destroyed completely. Completely destroyed. Now, there are two different... I want to bring this to your attention. There are two different types of, of, of people who exercise demons. You mean exercise, exercise that's you know, casting demons casting out? Casting demons, uh, demons spirits out of people. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you have that in the African religions and then you have it in Christianity today where people say if you are fearful of this and fearful of that you have a demon of fear in you so what we're going to have to do we're going to have to cast out a demon for you and when these people listen to a sermon from one of these people these pastors and there are actually preachers involved in these deliverance oh yes ministries. definitely that's what that's what's so sad about it what happens is they, they put on a, <coughs> a sermon in that church talking about the fact that many of you are undoubtedly demon possessed. You don't know it. Is it possible to be possessed by a demon and not know it? Well, no. 
Not if you're a Christian. If you are uh, yielding your life to Christ every day, day after day after day, you don't have to worry about demon spirits getting into your life. See? Now what happened is this. The speaker talks about the fact that he has delivered people from demon spirits. There was a hundred spirits that came out. It took ten hours of praying and of, of wrestling with the spirits to get them out of there. Now by the time that he's done with his sermon, a lot of the people that have different problems. For instance, one preacher says, if you have this certain type of allergy, this certain allergy, you're demon possessed. While this poor s sister says, she believed that she was demon possessed. And she said, now, if Jesus could not keep me from being demon possessed, what kind of a God is he? In the back of her mind. About it. So in reality, what you're saying is that these these supposed deliverance ministries mm -hmm. that are that are dealing directly with the occult and casting demons out of people are not are dangerous. Lord. Yeah, and dangerous. In Matthew the seventh chapter, the Lord says, "Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and your name have cast out devils, and your name done many wonderful works or miracles?" And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And this is, this is a, a strong message that he's giving to somebody, some preacher. Well, it's a, it's, it's a tremendous destruction of Christianity that these ministries are doing. They're doing a great disservice to Christ. What specifically is the problem with a deliverance ministry? A person that is involved in this type of ministry where they communicate with the spirits or with they them. Talk, they talk with the spirits and Start ask the them spirits. their names. Yeah, yeah. They have lost thought completely on Christ. The blood of the atonement has washed away from them. They think they're doing the work of Christ and they're doing the work of the devil because they're tearing people's faith down in, pri in Christ. There's one lady that's been calling me every week now, every uh, year Friday night, uh, and she's a, a commitment giving person. Or on Sunday, calls me for a, year, for a year and a half, as soon as my book on prayer came out. She's had demons cast out of her and all that. That person's fate is so low that uh, I wonder why, how she's able to keep, keep alive, keep believing in Christ. She called me here at 11.30 at night, Christmas Eve, last Christmas. I answered the phone. She said, Barimono, I got to talk to you. I'm sorry to have called you so late. And she cries, and she cries. And I said, Lady, what is the problem? And she, she finally was able to, to uh, uh, you know, stop crying. And then she told me, I was just washing the dishes a while ago, and a man's hand was placed on my left shoulder. I quickly turned around, there's nobody there. So she says, the same spirit that has been trying to take the wheels off my car and driving down the road. See, she had that experience also. The wheels were coming loose. She pulled in the service station, she says, something wrong with my car. The guy says, well, yes, you look at that, the nuts are half, half gone in your front wheel. So he tightens the nut, she gets back in the car, tighten the nuts, I should say, there's five of them, drive down another mile, and the same thing happens to do the same on the back. She stopped at a service station, and the guy says, yeah, look, he says, uh, you're, the nuts are coming off the wheel. And this is a lady who had had All these hundreds de of devils yeah. cast out of her ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she said, <clears throat> what am I going to do? I said, you're going to do what you need to do. Fortify yourself in the merits of the blood of Christ. And then I have to rebuild her confidence in the power of the Creator. You see? Talk to her about Colossians, about the creative power of Christ, that we are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and powers. You see? He's created them all. So anyway, that this lady, she told me, she said, would you mind if I call you every week? Because it seems that when I talk with you, I regain faith in the merits of God of Christ, enough to be able to sustain myself for a week. But then she says, if I don't call you, by the middle of the week, she says, I'm ready, I'm ready she says, to die. You know? She's a person of responsibility. 
I won't say what she works for, she's a federal government. And she's in a high position, highly paid person and, and uh, uh, super educated and, and a beautiful person, you know, and, and beautiful intellect. But uh, the person, she says, I'll never recover from this thing. I said, yes, sir, sister, you will rec recover from this. Don't you worry. What did you recommend to her? Well, it'd be, be uh, quite lengthy to go in, in, into it because she has such a bad case of everything. See. But you just have a few of these really hardcore cases that you work with very yeah. carefully. Mm -hmm. But some of them are um, wrecks after having gone through oh, these yeah. deliverance mm -hmm. ministries. That's the important thing. Yeah. Because once they've been told by a preacher, if they were told by the, the grocery uh, manager down, down the supermarket that they were demon-possessed because they have such an affliction, it wouldn't, it wouldn't destroy the faith in Christ. But when, when a man that says, I'm a minister of the gospel, uh, stands in a pulpit, and he says, if you have these certain fears or whatever it is, you are undoubtedly possessed by a demon. Now, the first thing that hit the mind is that, what kind of a savior do I have that couldn't keep me from becoming demon-possessed? The power of suggestion, we are told, is the greatest force on earth known to man. Mm -hmm. Alexander the Great, that conquered the world, he used the power of suggestion. He didn't want to use his armies. He said, I, I used the armies as the last resort. I used the power of suggestion, he says. So he had his, they would tempt themselves around the city, and they would have speakers that would go and speak every morning and evening to the people that were in the city, telling them to, to, to give up. You're not going to come out of this alive. And by tearing down the mind to the fact, to the possibility that they will survive, then negative thoughts come in and the people said, let's give in, he's going to have us anyway. And he, he, history tells us that he won the world not by the sword, but by the words that he spake, or that his people speak for him. So the power of suggestion is the greatest force on earth known to man that's been established by uh, well, uh, knowledgeable people. And when a minister of the gospel stands up in the pulpit and he says to the people that even though you're a Christian, you can be demon possessed. And you undoubtedly are. He destroys faith in the merits of the blood of Christ completely. When that faith goes down to a zero figure, you know what can take place then? Demon spirits can come right in. An avenue to the soul, man. And they camp home and they said, well, we, got, we got it. So, the preacher says, now at 7 o'clock tonight, we're going to meet here and have a service. Get these, these demons out. Get yourself prepared to maybe stay all night and pray all night for these demons. You see, one person, there's a number of people that called me and told me about these things. And people that have, like mothers that have had daughters that had, uh, you know what I mean? The demons and all that, uh, possessing them. Sad to see. A lot of them kill themselves. A lot of them kill themselves. And uh, they, the, the preacher will get there and they're going to start praying over this person, demon possessed, and talk with the demon and find out the name of the demon and find out where, where the demon has been doing for centuries. And they give all kinds of really interesting insights on the supernatural. The spirits love it. The spirits love it. And they come out when they feel like it. What's in their interest to keep right on talking with the preacher and say, I'm not going to go out. You know? And then another voice comes out and says, well, I'm Christine, you know, and another personality of hers, and uh, another demon, and all that. And, it's all know. demon games, is what you're demon saying. Demon games, yeah. And by the time that the, 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 the spirits are all out, the person is almost dead. Roger, there have been several people who have contacted you with special problems. And you have developed a seven-point plan to help someone who is either m has messed with the occult, or is involved in the occult, or is mm. being harassed. Would you share with us just the high points of that seven-point plan? Sure. I've had a number of people that have written me, or phoned, and uh, were highly distressed because of the fact that, you know, they were harassed by demon spirits, and they couldn't understand why. <clears throat> now, on page 534 of the Greek Controversy, there is a two-line statement here that I'd like to bring your attention. Satan is seeking to overcome men today as he overcame our first parents by shaking their confidence in that creator. 
Interesting, isn't it? Now, as I mentioned before, earlier, once a religious leader stands in the pulpit and t convinces people that they are demon-possessed, and their fate goes down to a zero figure. Demon spirits move in then, for, re for real. And they exercise these people, and these spirits, I should say, and etc. But then, um, I came up with a plane that people can really get some help and get it quick. <clears throat> now here's, I have written down here, here, here is a seven-step recovery program for those who are oppressed by demon spirit and who have been victimized through so-called deliverance ministries. You're not really deliverance, <clears throat> they're involved you more in that which is destroying your Christian experience or will separate you from God. Point number one, throw out or destroy all the literature that one has on deliverance ministries. Get rid of everything that they've given you. Demon spirits have a right to stay with all objects that bear the taint of their defilement. So it's not just items that relate to the occult they should get rid of, which they should get rid of, mm -hmm. but also anything that has to do with the deliverance ministry. That's right. Okay. Do not speak to demon spirits, even if it is to command them to depart in the name of the Lord Jesus, like I have done it before I was knowledgeable of the Word of God. Let me just understand that, that if a person is confronted, they should not even command a demon spirit to leave in the name of Jesus Christ, not even right. talk to them. What should they do? When, uh, let me bring something to your attention. When Jesus, a number of times in the Bible, we read that Jesus casted out demon spirits out of people. In this one instance, for instance, the spirits wanted to, to, to decide to talk, that he was a son of God. And Jesus forbid them to talk, because they are lying spirits. They'll say uh, three or four words of truth and ten of lies. And you put uh, it all together and people feel, you know, he's talking about the Lord Jesus so nicely, you've got to be of the Lord, you see. And it's not so in, in the world of uh, uh, spiritual conflict. If a person is in a situation where demonic power is evident, mm -hmm. they are not to even command that spirit to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. What? How are they to get rid of them? Do they kneel down and pray? No. Do they let the Holy Spirit do it? Yes. What do they do? You do it. They, you do it by the power of the Spirit of God. Now Jesus told the Jews that He casted out demons through the power of the Holy Spirit. He informed them on that, and. The Apostle Paul, we read in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, went to Ephesus, and Ephesus was a, a, a cult area of all kinds of, of uh, um, occultism, of uh, demon spirit involvement. It was a great center uh, of occultism for in the Roman Empire. And there he, re retained, he remained there for two years, and with 12 of, of his followers that he met there, uh, they prayed for the, these uh, Ephesians. They were pagans, they were, you know, there was no Christians living there at all. And we are told that he did a tremendous work, or I should say better than that, the Holy Spirit did a tremendous work in, as a result of their prayers. And the Spirit of God rested upon Paul so much that people would even come to him and, and with handkerchiefs and with aprons, it says. And the Bible says, and I quote verses 11 and 12, says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons. And the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits left them. Or, or, you know. So the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, is what does the cleansing and the regaining of the demons. You don't even have to mention, get out in the name of Jesus. And all that. It's, a, it's a fallacy, I'll tell you why. It's dangerous, that's what it is, because the spirits will re reply to you uh, most of the time. And you get involved with them, and you're, you're a loser because you become tainted. So immediately then, if you are confronted with a demonic power, mm -hmm. the thing you would do is pray and ask the power of the Holy Spirit to remove that demonic force. That's the correct oh, yeah. procedure. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I've, I've dealt with people that were demon-possessed. No question about it. In my business of, of Yellow Page Advertising, certain persons that nobody wanted to hang into the account. This, this guy is weird. One guy says, I think he's demon-possessed. He was a Baptist. 
So I think this guy's demon possessed. I want to never handle this account again. Okay. I go in there and the guy's uh, is blaspheming and hitting the the desk with his fist and he's talking to somebody over the phone, telling them to go somewhere in a real big hurry. And I just start praying for the Holy Spirit of God through the medicine of the blood of Christ shed on Calvary to do the work which Jesus said he, he would do. And by asking for the blood of Christ to be appropriated to this man, see, and that his sins be forgiven him, he probably has confessed his sins in 20 years, he has no desire to, but he's entitled to the freedom and the deliverance that Christ gives to us through his shedding of his precious blood. And I've seen people just like a big balloon that you put a, a pin into. Whew. The pressure is gone. The guy smiles. I hasn't smiled in a month. You know? One guy says, hey, man, he says, you know something? You've been here 10 minutes, and it's the only 10 minutes I've had of rest in the last week. He says, what are you, well, who are you anyway? <laughs> you know? He says, you've got a special power with you, man. Did you tell him it was the Spirit of God with you? I didn't tell him right there and then. But I did a little later. You mentioned two points. What's your third <clears throat> point? Go ahead and review the first okay. two. The first you one. throw away all literature and all matter of materials that has been related to these either uh, deliverance ministries or if you're involved with occultism some form or other. Don't speak to the spirits. Ignore them completely. And you just ask for the Lord by the power of his Holy Spirit in the medicine of the blood of Christ to drive away the spirits. Now you say, where do you get this thing? Well, I have a lot of verses from the Bible that I could sh show, prove it to you from. But I want to read you a quotation from page 431 of the Desire of Ages, because okay. it puts it real the way I like to, to have it. Earnest, persevering supplications to God in faith can alone avail, avail to bring men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle against principalities and powers the rulers of the darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in high places. And I've proven this for 45 years. This is not you to me. This is what I've experienced over the years. See? Excellent. Yeah. Now, part four, uh, uh, part three is early in the morning, read about the crucifixion of Christ. It takes four minutes without having to rush through it. Matthew 27 chapter, read verses 24 through 54. It will take you from Pil Judg uh, Pilate's Judgment Hall and bring you to Golgotha, and there you will see the, the, the Son of God expire on the cross. And that, that the earthquake took place. And even the Roman pagan says, truly, this was the Son of God. See? And as you read that, you visualize it, and you're actually there oh, yeah. each morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And uh, it'll change your life. One man phoned me up. He says, I've been going to Golgotha every morning now. He said, from Pilate's Judgment Hall to Golgotha every morning, like you told me last year. My life has changed. I'm not the same person. Praise the Lord. He says, I got a different view and understanding of the conflict between the force of good and evil. I understand more exactly what Jesus did for me. And he couldn't stop telling how, what it had done for his life. Now, you must ask God, even if in the middle of the afternoon, you pray ten times before that, okay? You're going to pray for about someone, or, or in a case like this, say, Lord, before I ask you for your help, I want you to make sure that if, I've, if I have offended you in thoughts, words, and deeds, that you remove the offenses by the medicine of the blood of Christ. I always, I always make sure that I have a clear, clean slate. Because the Bible tells us that the, the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And there's a lot of wickedness that can pass in our thoughts, man, even if we don't uh, stop ourselves to look at it, you know. And you have to pray for faith and for the power of Christ to save you. Now, we're told by the Feminine Inspiration that faith is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it flourish only as it is cherished. I will talk to you only right now about the first part. It's inspired okay. by the Holy Spirit. So if we need the faith, where do we go? We go to Christ or to the Father, and we plead for this very special blessing. And it will always be given you. Blessings that uh, are marvelous. Point seven is to memorize the Word of God in order to live a victorious, successful Christian life. And to memorize the Word of God, it automatically brings you faith, hope, joy in the Lord. And that is power. Roger. 
on the last book that you wrote on intercessory prayer, mm -hmm. did you experience any harassment at that time? Uh, yes, <laughs> some. So the demon spirits from 45 years ago still didn't want you talking. That's right. As I started to write the manuscript, I wasn't very gone uh, into it more than maybe while well, I'd written the first chapter of it uh, as, uh, you know, just for the kids to have something to read after if I pass away, they'll have something to know how the old man was able to pray and the Lord blessed, you know, my experience in the hospital in uh, Canada. But then, after Daniel had told me, Dad, you should write a book, and uh, I said, no, nah, I'm, I'm no writer when it comes to prayer. There's been so many books written on prayer. So he said, why don't you just write Mr. Richard Coffin that helped you with your first book, and Review and Herald, see what he says about it. And well, Mr. Coffin wrote back and says, yes, send us the 11-page manuscript that you have. We want to look at it. And uh, then, of course, uh, the good news came that they wanted me to, to uh, submit two more chapters. And then the entire manuscript. Well, as soon as I started the second chapter, it was in the daytime, the garage door started to open. Now, this is an old garage door. This, this house, by the way, is 100 years old, a little over 100 years old. The part next to it is, is new, fairly new. But that garage door is probably 40 years old, and it's one of those rollers up and down with the big springs. And it makes a terrible noise when, when you raise it and when you lower it. Especially when you get to be, a, when you bring it down, it's about a foot from the, from the floor. If you happen to let go of the handle, it hits that concrete and there are the glass panes, the panes of glass rattle, and, you know, makes a lot of noise. And it opened two or three times. I paid no attention to that. Hilda calls me from upstairs says, uh, come down here and see who's playing at the garage door. I said, I come down. I said, everything's all right. She says, you just sit here and you, you watch and see. She says, this door has been opened three times says, in the last half hour. Oh. And she said, didn't uh, Greg mow the lawn yesterday? Because I told her, I said, maybe Greg can get the lawn mower or something. He's going to do the lawn. No, he did it uh, yesterday, she said. Well, I got thinking right away. I can't believe it. See? I thought of the spirits right away. But uh, I said, don't worry about it. It's nothing at all. Sure enough, I was going up the staircase. I heard the thing rolling up and then rolling down. So I said, I'm going to go out there. I went out there, and there was nobody around at all. So I came back in to the Hilda. It's not going to happen again. She says, what do you mean it's not going to happen again? How do you know? I, I said, I don't know. Some There's a lot of teenagers around here. They must have opened the door and run, you see? But I knew exactly what had taken place. Because that evening, when she went to work, she worked night shift at the hospital, uh, I started to write again. When I started to write, the door started to, to roll up and down. Every 20 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, the door would roll up and down. And it would hit a concrete man and make an awful noise. So what went through your mind? Well, I prayed about it. I said, Lord, the spirits don't want me to write this, this book. But I'm not working for the spirits, I'm working for you. Okay? And I said, if you want me to tell my prayer experience, my prayer life for the last 45 years, you're going to have to help me get rid of those spirits. But it turned out that all that night, that door must have opened 50 times. Because I, I rode until 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. So I realized I was not going to be able to ride during the daytime. And the next night, same exact same thing. And it went every night that I rode that, I, uh, rode that manuscript. And I'll tell you what, I told the Lord, this, the next night, he did it again. I said, Lord, it's okay. You know, this is not heaven on earth. We're in the land of the enemy. So I can't put up with that, you know, as long as my wife is not scared to death. And that's what happened. I wrote the manuscript like this. And as soon as you finished the manuscript, it stopped. I'll stop, yeah. But you know, I can understand why the devil is so angry. You are giving a snapshot mm -hmm. of a side of his work that very few people have ever had an opportunity to see and live to tell about. Mm -hmm. And Ellen White tells us that there is nothing that the devil fears more, Roger, mm -hmm. than that his methods and his devices will be discovered and people will have a natural defense against them. Mm -hmm. So I can understand exactly why he was upset, but praise the Lord, the Lord's power was stronger yeah. and yeah. continues to be stronger. The Lord has been gracious to me over the years. I've been in some situations on the road with trucks 
and storms and snow and sleet and things. I was traveling so much. I was traveling uh, anywhere between uh, uh, 25 to 35,000 miles a year. And that's a lot of miles to put on the, on the road all the time. And I've seen so many instances where I could have been killed, man. Well, as a matter of fact, in my, my book on prayer, I, I talk about two or three incidents there. Well, it occurs to me that there's an old rule that says if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Yeah. And fortunately for you, 45 years ago, you were rescued, kind of a brand from the burning. That's right. Roger, and your testimony lives on. Yeah. You've walked into the shadow of death for 45 years, according yeah. to the priest, but if I read correctly in your book, you said you wouldn't mind that as long as the Creator walked with you. And That's He right. has, yeah. hasn't He? Mm -hmm. Definitely.